Expat Your Life. My name is Abram, and I'm bringing you stories for expats all around the world. Today's guest, we have... Chris. Chris, yes. All right. Chris, where are you from? I'm from jolly old England. England? Oh. So coming to Vietnam's definitely going to be a huge change for you. Definitely. Like, especially in weather, I've been here uh, quite a while now, I'm still not used to living. <laughs> uh, having my AC on in my apartment, I'm stepping out of like, just that humidity. Yeah. Like hot, hot weather in England is like 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. Here, 20 degrees is like midnight, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so even at night, you're just like, oh my gosh, why is it so hot? At night, it's like, this is a perfect summer's day. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And how long have you been in Vietnam? I'm going on close to two years now. Okay. Maybe like 20 months. Nice, nice. You like it so far? Yeah, I like it here. Yeah. I've never lived in such a big city before. My hometown, Nottingham, population of about 800,000. Okay. Here's like 8 million, 8.5 million. Yeah. So it's been a bit of a contrast to where I'm from. Um, I don't like some aspects. I know it's perfect. Um, but overall, yeah, I really like it. Good, good. Now, you know, we're going to jump into a little bit more, but what, why did you get Vietnam? Um, actually, my main reason I picked here was I already had a friend living here. Uh, so my original plan was to go to Japan. I timed it terribly with applying for jobs. <laughs> so I, I started looking for jobs in April, thinking I'd be ready for September. You know, the academic year starts in April, so it's no jobs. So then I thought, rather than wait another six, eight months, just sitting in my house doing nothing, what can I do? I want to go somewhere else. Where can I go? Oh, I've got a friend in Vietnam. So I messaged them, like, hey, if I come to Vietnam, can I crash at your place and set on my own place? And they were like, yeah, come on over, come on over. And since I've been here, I've been pretty much took me in the building. All of my, most of the friends I've made are friends I've maybe introduced me to. Um, but yeah, so my main reason for coming here was I couldn't get to Japan and I've got a friend already here. <laughs> nice, nice. So you, did, you, did you know anything about Vietnam before coming or just that you had a friend here and you're like, good to go? Not really. Like, every now and again, maybe she'd been here five years. Okay. So she'd come back, she'd tell me stories of Vietnam. Um, and then, Apart from that, all I knew about Vietnam was through like Hollywood films and stuff like that. Okay. okay. Like, my family knew even less. They thought I was going to be living in like some foot in the jungle. <laughs> when I showed them pictures of Saigon, they're like, "Wow, it's amazing!" I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you're, you're like, "Come join me." Yeah. <laughs> no, no, mum, stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, "Yeah, don't see, don't you, see me." Don't horrible, see me. horrible. Don't come. <laughs> but I'm not coming home. <laughs> Understandable. Understandable. So. You've been here for almost two years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had some experiences. You came over with a friend. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back before even like the Japan trip. Yeah. And let's go into the motivations. Of what caused you to think about leaving your home country, leaving the city that you know, and, like, your friends and family? Well, so from the age of 15 to 29, I was in a long-term relationship. 14 years, almost 15 years. Uh, I was engaged to be married, and about two months before the wedding, she left me for some time. Obviously devastated, uh, depressed for a while, but then after about 18 months, I'm kind of like, well, what, what do I do now? What can I do now? Like, my whole life plan is gone. And I realized I can do anything I want. Um, so then, the Honeymoon was supposed to be a three week trip to Japan. I said, fuck it, I'm gonna go on my own anyway. And I fell in love with traveling. Not just, I fell in love with Japan, but I also just fell in love with traveling on my own in general. So when I came back, I was like, I wanna do more of that. So that's when I started to think, oh, okay, maybe I'll try and get, find a job teaching English in Japan. And then that's kind of led on to how I ended up in Vietnam. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, ultimately I realized I was reaching the age of 30 and I'd done nothing exciting in my life. Like the most exciting thing I'd ever done was like two weeks in Disney World. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I want to want to do some big. I need to something that I can look back on later in life. I did that. Okay. And that's yeah. I wanted to live in a new country. I timed it poorly for me because I was trying to get my life back on track. I've made some friends again. I'm in a good spot, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw all of that away. I move to the other side of the world and start in from scratch. Now, you know that is a crazy story, yeah. um, and you know it sounds like you rebounded and you're doing well, so that's good. Now, my question would be like, looking back at that, looking back at the move and being here almost 20 months, almost hitting that two-year point, do you regret any of it? No, not exactly. Some, some bits are hard, uh, relationships here are hard, uh, language and cultural differences, um, but no, like, it's been the best two years of my life since I've moved here, so I definitely don't want to regret that. Okay. Now, you know, you're talking about relationships, you're talking about, like, just things that have happened. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the last two years that has been just Tell me your worst experience. I'll say that on camera. What's <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's safe for YouTube? Um, just terrible first things. Um, where one minute I think, oh, we're getting on, and then she's out of nowhere. I'm going home now. Like, oh, okay. Um, some near-death experiences on the road. Plus, plus a weekly occurrence. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have very aware of my mortality now. Um, but no, like, I think the hardest thing really is relationships because, especially with fellow expats, it's hard to build a really strong friendship. It's different now because we're in the middle of COVID and people are essentially trapped here, but everyone I know has long term goals I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to go to this place. So you spend two years or a year like making friends with these people who are friends and then suddenly they're gone. So it's kind of, I'm very aware that all the friends I make, it's transitory. Everyone's going away. I've got plans to go elsewhere. Same with relationships. Here, when you get in a relationship with someone, it's, well, we're going to get married, we're going to have kids. And I'm like, whoa, like, I, I want to do other things before I'm ready for that. So that kind of creates some friction with their expectations of the relationship and my expectations of the relationship. So like, yeah, and dating is tough. I think that's the hardest part. Uh, people that I've really liked, and thankfully we're still good friends now, but we've dated for like six months, and she's talking about getting married. I'm, I'm like, Whoa. And I don't want to say like, I'm not going to marry you. <laughs> it's, just not, it's not a nice thing to say, but then I start to feel guilty that she's got these expectations of where relationships go in. But in the back of my mind, like, oh, I want to go to another country. So that's kind of difficult. Uh, that kind of makes you depressed of like, you don't want to hurt them, but you really like them, but I want to travel and do other things. So yeah, like, my lowest points are all being relationship based. <laughs> okay. Now, what about a high point? Fine, fine. The, the opportunity is here because the pay is not great but the cost of living is so low so things to do are so cheap so just things like going stand up paddle boarding on a river and it was like 100k mm -hmm. so like five dollars something like that for as long as you want and doing crazy stuff like that um, traveling the country and like getting a flight to another place for like 30 dollars it's crazy. <laughs> that is pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like, yeah, but the highlights are just like, I've not done anything too crazy here. Uh, I was meant to travel the train track north, I to stop at different cities and experience different cities. That didn't happen because true, true typical Brett got really bad this is there. <laughs> like so bad, I, I had to go to hospital and had to come back to Saigon and was apartment bound for like three months. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've got photos which you won't put on here, it's yeah. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's like scabs all down my back. It's like, horrible. Um, so I've not, and then I've run out of money and I had to get a job. And then I've not had time to like travel and do all the crazy stuff 
if I want to do. Mm -hmm. But I just look at that. If I have time, I just get the cheap flight and go somewhere. Se not Saturn, but I travel to see where they are. Um, but no, it's the crazy stuff that you can do in Saigon, like build the tallest building in Southeast Asia and have a drink at the top. I love that. I love a tall building. <laughs> when I see a tall building, I'm, I'm going for a top of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care how it's going to happen, yeah. but I'm getting to the top. Yeah. <laughs> like, when I first came here, I saw the, the Texaco Tower. I was like, it's the Avengers Tower. Well, I have to go up. <laughs> and then I saw, on the same day, I went and saw a landmark. I was like, no, it's higher. I'm going to go up. And I'm going to have a drink. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the drink's bonus. Like, I'm, I'm going to go to the top. As high as I can get. Um, and I, yeah. In terms of like crazy stuff, I go to work, I'll meet up with friends, have a drink, sleep, and go to work. That's, I think that's one aspect of expat life people don't realise is after the first few months, like it's life, it's normal, you have a 9 to 5 job, or you have like an evening and you can get teaching, and then like, that's it. You wake up, you do your business in the day, you go to work, come back, go to sleep, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, which I was warned about by my friend, like, well, it's not one big crazy adventure, like, it's because normal life. And I've reached that point now where I'm now just like, this, this is normal for me. I think that's maybe why I've got itchy feet. And with, with COVID-19 right now, yeah. kind of putting a damper on things, yeah. there's probably a lot of people that have the same itchy yeah. feet, yeah. and they're ready to make that move, but they're, like you're saying, they're trapped where they're at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I'm essentially trapped, but I can't think of anywhere else I'd rather be trapped. Right now. That's the same here. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just in terms of like, I mean, it's great here, but in terms of like COVID, apart from the odd outbreak, like life's normal here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, go, I go out drinking with friends and do stuff back over. Like, even in Japan, where I want to go, everywhere's closed, mm -hmm. it's really restricted. So even where I want to go, I'd rather be here. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of see, you know, we talked about your positive experiences, your negative experiences. What are some of the pros and cons that you see living here in Saigon? Um, the biggest pro is, as an expat, you're very fortunate where, especially a British or American English speaking expat rather, it's very easy to find work as a teacher. It's not the best job in the world. But it's not the best pay. But compared to the cost of living, you're, you live like a king. Um, you save so much money. You can do so many things. And uh, having money here is probably the most important. And if you have money, you can do what you want. Yeah. Even illegal stuff, just backhand, the five hundreds, or even just a five hundred to one of the pops and they're like, you go there. Yeah. I mean, take that as a pro if you want. <laughs> Corruption is rife, but it's probably a good thing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like, that's the biggest pro, it's like, especially in England where the cost of living is significantly higher than here. Um, and suddenly coming here, it's like, I've got some money, I've got enough free time to do stuff with it, like, what do I do? Um, so that's been the biggest pro for me, just, if you're, if you're wanting to save money, um, biggest con, I think, is the cultural barrier. Um, I learned very quickly, don't ask why, just accept that's the way it is. Yeah. If you keep asking why, you just get frustrated and confused. Um, just little things like in the supermarket, you're in the line, and someone's come up right in front of you, blatantly put their shop in, and you're like, why are you doing that? Um, usually, it's not them trying to push, it's like we just want to put it on the till ready for when we get there. But for the first like month, you're like, why are people just like walking up? Stuff in front of like, no, don't do that. Um, even stuff at work, like, why are you doing it this way? Um, I complain about, to my friends all the time about Grab drivers. Uh, so, if you don't know, Grab is like Uber, but are usually on bike. Um, the drivers cannot navigate to save their life. <laughs> even with a sat nav telling them to turn right or turn left, I'm like, why are you, why are you going this way? Again, now I don't know why, so I use 
he's got his own way, but he's going to take me. Um, so yeah, the biggest con for me, aside from the relationship stuff I've already mentioned, is just cultural stuff that get me frustrated, like, why am I doing it the way I'm used to? It makes logical sense to me. Uh, yeah, that's my biggest con. <laughs> I just get frustrated with people. Why are we doing that? Or why aren't we doing that? Like the cast of frustration. Yeah. Again, if you learn, don't ask why. Just, okay, we're doing it here. Give them time and we'll get there. <laughs> I'm living in their country. I just need to yeah. do it their way. Yeah. yeah. Completely understanding. Yeah. Uh, I think my, one of my biggest pet peeves is the driving the long way. Mm. And then it's not only do they drive the long they turn off all of their lights. Yeah. And then if you get in their way, they honk at you and yell at you mm. because you're going in the same, the, the right direction. Actually, uh, a good friend of mine had a bike crash recently. He was on a main road, and he was good. He was more right for him. And a guy was turning right. Yeah, he was turning right. And for whatever reason, just stopped dead. And my friend went straight into the back of him. Um, obviously, my might managed to slow down enough, but the guy's bike fell on his leg and the exhaust. Oh, on the leg. Yeah, uh, now he's got a huge, huge scab down here. You're not going to see that, but he's got a huge scab on his leg. Uh, like, he was trying to push it off. The guy was like, probably in shock, not know what to do. Finally got it off. And my friend, he's Canadian, he was like, Why did you stop? And the guy's like, I can't speak English. Uh, apart from, I think you can say one phrase in English but said it the worst thing at the worst time. He just went, Welcome to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Which my friend was like, oh, I want to hit this guy. <laughs> um, but I was like, He's either got a really dry sense of humour or that's like the one phrase in English. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it the worst possible time. <laughs> They can both be comedic and just yeah. like, ah, oh, frustrating. Well, n now when we talk about it, you'll laugh about it, but when it happened, you're just like, so angry. Mm -hmm. And like, no one stopped to help. People just kind of like slow down, but when he was moving, he was driving. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh, man, that's... <laughs> that's a, very <laughs> that's a very interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I've not had anything like that. The worst I've had, I used to say, is like, the drive down the wrong side of the road. We're at the bottom of my street. Our driver was stopped. Um, we've got the barrier, so it's one way. Another guy came down the other way. Starts to turn into our lane, but cut right over the corner and went straight into the side. Luckily, he wasn't going too fast when we were stopped, so I literally like, jumped off the back of the bike. Uh, the guy when came off his bike. My grab driver shouted at him, asked me if I was okay. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, small collisions like, every day. Like, someone pulling out and you them. Or, and some quite wide as well, and stuff like this, and you know. yeah, yeah, understandable. Um, I I took grabs for my first few weeks uh, uh, exclusively here. I took grab bikes everywhere, so I, I completely understand. I don't do it right. Yeah. I've driven like in Bungtao and Phuket. Mm -hmm. Driven, loved driving there. I went on a date here in District Seven. She said, "Oh, you drivers." I had two near-death experiences driving in the streets. I remember, I'm not driving in Saigon well, ever again. <laughs> I almost, almost got hit by a bus, which I blame her for. She was like, oh no, you can turn. Started to turn, the bus came out. Oh. Yes. We, we could not turn. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I'm never driving here again. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is definitely a nerve-wracking experience. Uh, after driving here, though, you should have nerves. Oh, just like, whatever. Yeah. Did you die though? No. <laughs> One thing I'm worried about is when I go back home to visit, I'm so accustomed here to just walking out into the middle of the street because the bikes go around you. When I get home, I'm just going to walk out into a busy street. <laughs> just get clipped. Yeah. Straight away. Like out of me, Joe Black, when I get hit by two cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That, that, uh, that is one of the things here too, is just cross the street wherever you want. You can, uh, Stick your arm up yeah. and walk. And Don't even look. Yes. <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen that. Uh, so, yeah. so now let's let's jump back to it. Uh, you know, we've talked about good things, bad things. We've talked about pros and cons. 
someone who's thinking about not just moving to Vietnam, but someone who's thinking about leaving their home, uh, their home country, mm -hmm. what would be the biggest piece of advice that you would give? My biggest piece of advice would be just do it. Uh, I spent so long thinking, oh, should I do it, should I do it, thinking about it, and oh no, it's such a huge change, I'm not ready. And eventually, I just did it. And it was the best decision I've ever made. And it's so easy to get caught into the minutiae of being like, what, what am I going to do about this, what am I going to do about that, cultural stuff, the language barrier. All that pales in comparison to when you actually do it. And you're here, you figure everything out when you get here. Sure, it's great to do research, like try and learn a bit of a language before you come. Um, but 90% of the stuff you worry about in your head, you just figure out naturally when you get there. Um, so yeah, like my biggest advice is just go for it. Don't think too much. Think a little bit. Don't make any stupid decisions, but don't get caught in my new show. I shouldn't, I shouldn't know. Just go. Now, you know, just going for it, that's kind of a common theme that I hear. We use a lot of experts. You should just, just do it. Just go. Um, Obviously, you made up your mind. Did you tell your friends and your family that you were going? So you just, yeah, I mean, my friends especially knew I'd always had plans that I want to live in Japan. Ever since I went there for what was supposed to be my honeymoon, it's like, this is a place I want to live. Actually, the first time I went, I was like, oh, I think I could live here. I like it here. Second time I went, I was like, I I love it here. Third time I went, I was like, I need to move here. <laughs> um, so like my friends, my family always knew like I want to live in Japan, but to them that's like maybe a pipe dream that's never going to happen. Or so far in the future, something they're thinking about. And then suddenly, so I, I messaged my friend and I was like, oh, I'm going to crash yours. And then suddenly, I was, so my family was like, I'm going to move to, I'm going to, move to Vietnam. And they're like what? Like why Vietnam? Like I've got a friend there, and like they can help me establish myself. And um, my friends was like. Go for it. Um, like with what you've been through, like, go for it. My dad, again, he was like, "Oh, I'm proud of you. Like, you're doing something with your life, changing things." My 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 oldest sister, uh, she was the same. My my other older sister was like, "I just want to live in like, everything is here. Why would you want to move somewhere else?" So she didn't really understand. My mum hates. That I am in the country and the opposite side of the world. Um, she is very used to all our family being very close. Not emo not just emotionally, but like physically. They live so close to each other, they can just walk down the street and pop in for a cup of tea and say hi. And then suddenly I'm on the opposite side of the planet. I remember the, the one thing she said that you know, I'm not allowed to do is get married and have a kid. Yeah. <laughs> because I keep saying like, so when I first got to say, oh, I want to move to Japan, I was like, well, how long for? I'm like, well, maybe six months. And then, then was, I think I told her, I was like, well, how long for? Like, maybe a year. And it's like, maybe, we'll see. <laughs> and then since I've come here as well, it's like, when are you coming back? Well, maybe December. <laughs> like, are you going to stay? Probably not. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So my mum hates that I'm here. The rest of my family and my friends were like, go for it. Apart from my sister, like, I don't know why you want to live anywhere else. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, that's that's good. I mean, at, at least you're still in contact with them, yeah. and at least you know you got to see it, and experience it on your own, mm -hmm. rather than just listening to them be like, no, stay, please yeah. don't go. You, you made that sound. Yeah. Oh, well, you need to work. I'm thinking about it. I'm confident in my abilities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm qualified. I've been told already, like, it's so easy to find work out here. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even have a job lined up. I just got here and then stopped. Ah, nice. Mm -hmm. Somewhere with me. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. All right. Now, what lessons have you learned since you moved abroad? The, the biggest lesson I probably learned is, I don't know, let's start again. Uh, I was, I know, was, <laughs> I was particularly loud. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I think it might be for a yeah. I'll speak a little louder. Yeah. Three, two, one. 
All right, so uh, you know, moving forward again, uh, what lessons have you learned since you moved abroad? Um, so the biggest lesson for me is that I can do things. So before I came here, I was really shy, uh, suffered with anxiety, all sorts. Uh, so I never believed in my abilities to do anything. Hated public speaking. Came here. Suddenly, I've got to survive on my own words. I can't speak the language. How do I go about doing this? I've got to teach English to 16 kids. I've got to overcome my fear of talking to groups of people. Um, and I learned I can do that. I can communicate with people without knowing the language. I can stand up in front of a group of people and deliver a lesson, even when we're talking. <laughs> um, so now going back, if I if I was to go back home and get a job, any job with public speaking, like, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so my biggest lesson is that I can do the stuff that I thought I'd never be able to do. Mm -hmm. Even Three years ago, I never thought I'd be here. Uh, I never thought I'd be stood in front of groups of people delivering lessons to people. Um, so yeah, my, my biggest lesson is that I don't doubt myself. I know I can, even though, even though I think I can't do it, do it because I probably can't. And that just can probably amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my kids love me. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I feel like half the time, like, stop talking, stop talking, do your work, and then suddenly, like, oh, teacher, we love you. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, kids. It's all you get so much kids. Yeah. Like, one kid, it was a bit of shit. I would tell him off over and over again, and then one day he run, runs up to a teacher and gives me a hug. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, we don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> You're my enemy, why are you hugging me? <laughs> Oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll uh, go into the next question, mm -hmm. um, and you know we talked about family, we talked about friends, and, and how you know what they think of you being abroad. Mm -hmm. We talked about lessons, pros and cons, awesome experiences, negative experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, now let's kind of go into what helped you make the decision. What gave you the idea to be an expat? Was it like Book? Was it any type of media or talking with someone or stories? So the thing that originally got me to traveling, uh, like one of my favorite YouTube channels that I brought in Japan, English guy living in Japan, really funny, really informative videos about traveling and life in Japan. Uh, so I, that kind of gave me the bug like, I want to travel, I want to do stuff. Um, but the thing that really gave me the push was a book, it's one of my favorite books, and it's called Yes Man. There's a movie made of it, don't watch a movie, it's terrible. The book is brilliant. Uh, it's about a guy who stuck in a rut, he's miserable, his friends keep asking him to come out, he says no all the time, so eventually they stop asking him to come out. And then one day, he's talking to a stranger, and the stranger says, you should say yes to him. So the one day he says, you can say yes to everything. Has a brilliant day, does all, almost gets into a fight, but doesn't. And he's like, on a high, like, oh, that's brilliant. So he's like, I'm gonna keep saying yes to everything until the end of the year, I think like three months or something. He's like, I'm not gonna tell anyone that that's what I'm doing, that people will take advantage. Uh, and he, he ends up like traveling around the world, meeting these amazing people. And it's such a life-affirming book. And the lesson he says at the end is, don't just say yes to everyone else, also say yes to yourself. The things you want to do, just say yes. And then, so yeah, about time when I was thinking, I should I shouldn't know, it's a big thing. I read that book again and I'm like, I'm gonna say yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. So anything in life that you're having doubts about whether you should do it, I recommend that book. Because you'll just finish reading that and you think, I'm just gonna say yes to every opportunity back in the And that's how you end up with a cycle of <laughs> <laughs> Just do it and say yes. Yeah, you say yes, worry about it later. <laughs> Nice, nice. All right, so uh, going from that, now I just want to go in and ask you, is there a quote or is there a saying that you have that you live by or something that someone else has said that hits you uh, so profoundly that it, you kind of made it your mantra? So one of my favorites is a song lyric. Uh, it's quite short, 
it's just if you truly believe in something, somehow it all works out. Um, which I think mean, I kind of at first I was like, oh, I don't believe that. But then I thought, no, if you truly want something, you're you're gonna try your best to achieve it. And you'll find a way of doing it. Um, so I think yeah, that's probably one in a positive way, that's something that's like affecting your mind. So like, if you really want to do something, if you really want to live in another country and there's things stopping you, if you'll find if you truly believe you want to do that, you will find a way of doing it and it'll all work out and you'll end up there. That's something. So that's, that's for the last like three years. That's been my mantra. I truly want to do this. I'll find a way. To do it. So, yeah. If you if you truly believe in something, somehow it will work. That's that's excellent. That's excellent. Now before we wrap everything up, I just want to ask you if you have like a social media page where people can find you or Instagram, anything. Yep. I have an Instagram. It's Chris Out of Knots with underscores between each word. Because my username was Chris of Nuts, no longer in Nuts. <laughs> so Chris out of Nuts. I just post funny things I see around Vietnam um, or like some amazing architecture that I'll see. Mostly just funny stuff. Funny stuff. Uh, things like the terrible English on the back of people's shirts to take a picture. Uh, another one for the collection. Uh, so yeah, if you want like a small snippet of what Saigon is like, follow me on Instagram, Chris Alphonse. Okay. All right, Chris, thank you very much for no being an in interview today. No and, uh, yeah. So this was the interview with Chris. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you like the content, please, or content today, please hit the like button. Uh, consider subscribing to the account. And if you do, hit that notification bell so you know when the next video comes out. Until next time, stay awesome, stay traveled, stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye. I have to come up with a catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs>